but now we you know we we have seen something very interesting. We can combine LSI systems in cascades. Of course, it is a minor variation or a very easy question to answer when we ask what happens to LSI systems in parallel, that is very easy to answer. So, suppose you have the same x n being given to two LSI systems in parallel with impulse responses h 1 n and h 2 n. By parallel, you mean you apply the same input and then add the output. The answer is very easy. Can we find an equivalent system for this? And if so, what is the equivalent system? Well, it is very easy to see. That y of n is equal to x n convolved with h 1 n plus x n convolved with h 2 n. And of course, this can be written as summation k over all k integer h 1 n minus k plus summation on k x k h 2 n minus k, which of course, is very easy to combine. This does not require any great knowledge of just a simple distributivity property of multiplication that we know very well, where h n is equal to h 1 n plus h 2 n, very easy. So, in fact, when we have two LSI systems in parallel, there is an equivalent LSI system whose impulse response is the sum of the impulse responses of the individual LSI systems. Simple enough. So, now we are well in a position to deal with any combination of LSI systems in cascade or in parallel or a combination of cascade and parallel. Is that right? We can always find an equivalent LSI system for them. The only problem is, if you wish to find an equivalent LSI system for a cascade, it is hard work, because you have to do a very cumbersome operation, convolution. So, this is another reason why we might want to see, if you can go to some other domain or go into some other mode, where I can carry this operation out more easily. And in fact, it is quite beautiful, how several questions in signal processing converge to one answer. Now, recall that the whole reason why we started discussing linear shift invariant systems was to deal with sinusoids. We come back to the same story again. There we had those sinusoids, we had complex exponentials, because we did not want sinusoids. And the reason we, why we wanted complex exponentials was that, although a change of amplitude could be, could be represented as multiplication by a constant, changes of phase could not but they could if you dealt with complex exponentials. And therefore, we asked what is the system which leaves a complex exponential as it is in frequency, but changes only the amplitude and phase. And we said that system must be LSI. Now, we need to justify that. So, why have we worked so hard to build all these properties of convolution, unless we can show that we have indeed got where we wanted to. So, now let us ask the question, what happens when we feed a complex exponential? of angular frequency omega, we will use small omega. And let me now bring in some notation here. So, what happens when we feed in a complex exponential of angular frequency omega into an LSI system, let us call it S with impulse response H n. Now, a few remarks about the about the angular frequency omega. Henceforth, we are going to use what are called normalized periods and frequencies.
And what we mean by that is that we shall assume that the sampling angular frequency, or the, well, let us first take the sampling frequency itself. We will take the sampling frequency to be one unit. You know, the unit is our choice ultimately, whatever it is. If it is 10 kilohertz, we will say 10 kilohertz is one unit. If it is 1 megahertz, we will say 1 megahertz is one unit. So, we will say the sampling frequency is one unit, is the unit frequency, whatever. So, you can always choose your unit. And therefore, of course, the sampling period is also one unit, obviously. It is the reciprocal of the frequency. Of course, these are units of different quantities. Sampling frequency is, has units of frequency, whatever they might be, and sampling <coughs> periods have units of time. So, therefore, the sampling angular frequency becomes 2 pi times 1 unit. So, when we are dealing with a discrete system, we will assume that we have chosen the unit, so that one unit is equal to the sampling frequency. And therefore, the sampling period is 1. And thereby, we shall use small omega to denote what is called the normalized angular frequency. or the angular frequency in these units now we need to reflect for a minute what the unit of this normalized angular frequency would be you see when we normalize we divide so for example if you say you have normalized the angular or you have normalized the frequency of sampling, you have actually divided the sampling frequency by the actual sampling frequency. So, for example, if your sampling frequency were 1 megahertz, you have divided all frequencies by 1 megahertz to get the normalized frequency. Similarly, if you have divided the angular frequency in a similar way to get the normalized quantity, then, in fact, what you have done is to replace radians per second. Radians per second was the unit of angular frequency as it were, but you have divided this by the sampling frequency in actual value. So, radians per second divided by per second or hertz leaves you with radians, and therefore, the units of normalized angular frequency here are radians, not radians per second. Similarly, the units of period or units of frequency are null, there are no units, okay, because you have divided hertz by hertz, they are just numbers. Yes, there is a question. Okay, so, the question is, is it appropriate to think of this as a unit or to think of this as an angle? Well, both are correct. You see, what we are saying in a way, what omega denotes is how much of angle is covered in a unit sample time, in a sample time. So, you see, when omega is equal to 2 pi, that means, when you have, sample, when you have used the sampling frequency itself, then you have covered an angle of 2 pi in a sample time, right. So, essentially omega is a measure of the angle covered in one sample time that is another interpretation, yes. That is why the unit is radians. All right, then we will agree then to use the normalized angular frequency, because you see we are going to use the integer n to denote the sample number and also to, to denote the sample time, since the sampling time is unity. So, therefore, we have e raised to the power j omega n as the complex exponential, otherwise we would have to write down e raise to the power omega t s times n and so on, right. So, we do not need to do that now. So, when we feed e raise to the power j omega n to this LSI system s, 
with impulse response H n, we know what we get out. We will get out e raise to the power j omega n convolved with H n. Now, here we are going to invoke the commutativity of convolution and that would give us H n convolved with e raise to the power j omega n equally well from commutativity. that right? So, if we use that expression, then it gives us summation k going from minus to plus infinity h k e raise to the power j omega n minus k and that is very easy to break up. It is k from minus to plus infinity h k e raise to the power j omega n e raise to the power minus j omega k. Now, note that here e raise to the power j omega n is independent of k. So, I can draw it out of the summation and I am left then with an infinite summation on k. The infinite summation on k is in fact a function of omega and a function of h. So, let me denote this summation, summation from k going from minus to plus infinity h k e raise to the power minus j omega k by capital H of omega. Whereupon, what we have said essentially is that e raise to the power j omega n going into the system S with impulse response h n has led to e raise to the power j omega n coming out, but multiplied by a complex constant capital H of omega. Please note that capital H of omega is a complex constant, but of course, at the moment we have kind of you know brushed something very important under the carpet. Let us look back at this expression here. H omega is summation k going from minus to plus infinity h k e raise to the power minus j omega k. There is an infinite summation here. Now, infinite summation is not guaranteed to converge. An infinite summation can diverge. In fact, this is a problem with convolution in general and we had brushed this issue under the carpet even the last time. We had conveniently ignored that issue altogether. That is because we had dealt with finite length sequences. So, convergence was never an issue, but in case our sequences happen not to be of finite length, there could be a problem in the summation whether it is in the context of convolution or it is in the context of this response that we see here. 